checking on the toilet, so I'm hoping it gets better. Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful, rainy, lovely day. How's everybody doing today? Good? Yeah? Are you guys ready to worship? I'm ready to worship. Lord, I just lift up this time, and we just give you glory, and we give you honor, and we give you our praise. Father, I just ask that you would just fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Let it move. Do what you want to do. Help us to lay down at your feet every worry, every everything that would be weighing against us. And you just help us to give us, give you our hearts completely and fully. Pray that you would anoint this time, that you would anoint the service, and that you would just fill us, Father, with all that you have. In Jesus' name precious name. Amen. Turn your ear to heaven and hear the noise inside. The sound of angels, all the sound of Angel songs and all this for a king. We will go in and sing all for Christ the King. Turn your ear to heaven and hear the noise inside. The sound of Angels are the sound of angel songs and all this for a king. We could join and sing all for Christ the King. How constant and divine this song of ours will rise. Oh, how constant and divine this song love of us will rise, will rise. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. He is holy. He is holy. Oh, praise. Oh, praise. joyous noise, the sound of salvation come, the sound of the rescued one, and all this for a king, angels join and sing, all for Christ the King, how infinite and 
sweet this love so rescuing oh how infinitely sweet this great love that has redeemed has won we sing oh praise him oh praise him he is holy he is holy oh praise oh praise You are good, good, oh, 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 oh. Let the King 
of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. And let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good. Good. So good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good, good. Oh, Heart 
Be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. And let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song.
You're the hope in the dark, the beat in my heart, the faith that lives on. Oh, Jesus, you're my saving grace, the dance in the rain, my quiet place. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. We live for you, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. 
down and we fall down we lay our crowns at the feet of jesus the greatness of mercy and love at the feet we fall down yes we fall down we lay our crowns at the feet of jesus the greatness of his mercy Jesus and we cry holy 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 we cry holy 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 yes we cry holy 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 is the Lamb and we cry yes we We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We fall down. Yes, we fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of, the feet of Jesus, and we cry holy. Holy, holy, yes, we, we cry, holy, 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 yes, we cry, holy, 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 is the Is that better? There we go. Good morning, church family. <laughs> Good to see you all. Oh, thank you, worship team. All right, let's see. Well, kids and babies are released to go to their classes. And Sam and Lavenna um, are on sabbatical still. And I think we have some, there we go. We got some pictures of them. Yay, look at that. That looks like fun. So you know what? Let's pray for them. Um, as they're arriving home. I'm not sure when that is, but it's soon. So, Father, we come before you, Lord. We thank you for our leaders of Pastor Sam and Lavenna. Lord, we ask for your abundant blessing upon them. As they return home, let them still be in a place of relaxation and rest and focused on you, Father. Bless them abundantly, Lord. We thank you for them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Looks like they had some fun. All right, so play additions this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Uh, come back at 2 if you're interested in auditioning for the play. And if you have any questions, you can see Darlene. And next Saturday at 10 a.m., Janine will have the cooking small group. You want to raise your hand, Janine? There we go. If you have any questions, you can talk to her. And let's see. 
Oh, I'm going to be working on a special project updating our church roster. We've got a lot of new faces, and we want to keep it up to date and um, just get all your information. So next Sunday before church, I'll be handing out forms for you to fill out, and if you could get back, get them back to me that morning, because <laughs> if you take them home, we might not see them again. So I um, appreciate your help with that. All right, so now we're going to go to CFPC, Sunday Morning News, with Shirley Faith. My name's Antonio Smalls, and this is City Hall. Here we are in City Hall, ready to do a surprise interview. Come with me. acquired. He has no idea we're here. Uh, I am stealth. I am a leopard. He has never seen me before. I think we're compromised. <laughs> so, Mayor, tell me. Have you ever heard of uh, Father Abraham? The one who had many sons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the uh, considered probably the greatest example of faith in all of scripture by many. Yeah, probably. He's probably the first one in the Bible that's mentioned, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You see, we're talking about Father Abraham this week. And in honor of the story and Father Abraham, we, uh, we actually... Uh, brought in Evan Hogtide. Evan, did do we do we not do we not get Evan? Did he get away? Again? That's the second time. Okay. Well, no sacrifice then. Yeah, we we tried to get Jacob, but he lived too far away. So we found Evan, and he's already escaped twice. So I think for me, one of the most substantial parts of the whole story of Abraham is just the simple fact that God spoke and Abraham said yes. And he was blessed for it. Can you give me an, an example of a time that the Lord has led you in a direction and, and just purely on faith, you said yes, and then God led you? Well, sure. Uh, in my mid-30s, just realizing God called me to ministry and just in faith leaving a really well-paid job and taking a great step of faith uh, to go into ministry and God has really blessed that yeah yeah and uh would you say that the same kind of a circumstance is, is uh is what brought you to Coquille in the first place maybe yeah oh yeah for sure because uh we had no idea Coquille existed and that's part of our whole story is God specifically talked to us about moving, about relocating our family into something unknown and that he had something special for us here. And boy, did that turn out to be true, for sure. Excellent. Very similar kind of story and interesting, uh, interesting how those things happen. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And now you may not be the father of nations, but in a way, you are the father of this town. And I, I heard you have 70 children, too. Is that is that correct? What? 70 children? Yeah. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> just, just the father. Okay, so not that close to Abraham, but still, some comparisons we can draw between the two. It was true that, uh, that Abraham was also very old. Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah. 
Oh. Another comparison. <laughs> so, Sam, this uh, mayoral stuff, does that come with a lot of protein? <laughs> protein? Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> what the? What? Oh. Yeah, there we go, buddy. There you go. Hey. <laughs> Protein, right there. 35 grams of protein? 35 grams, Sam? I lose more than 35 grams of protein when I go to the bathroom in the morning. <laughs> so, exactly how are you being a mayor from a boat? You, you are on a cruise, is that correct? Yeah, technically I am on a cruise right now, yes. And and still the mayor? Yes, definitely still the mayor, but but unplugged, not talking to anybody. Except you don't have to, like, pass off the role to a, a surrogate mayor and then, like, <laughs> fight him to, to reestablish the title upon return to the city? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trooper Cooper, he's my surrogate mayor. You will lose. Yeah, Smalls, I am so excited. Uh, Levin and I are just taking a break, chilling out. We're actually on a cruise right now. And so we love all of you. Love you, Antonio Small. So excited for this series, Messy Faith, and can't wait to catch back up in July and August with you all. Excellent. All right. Ready to sign off? I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's do it. You know what time it is, folks. Take care. God bless. And remember to always keep flexing your... Back to you, Shirley. So anyway, Ur was about 550 miles away from Israel. Sure. You probably didn't know that because you didn't have Google Maps. Google? Yes. What? Yes. Anyway, <laughs> Abraham, what qualifications did you have to lead this trek? Well, yeah, I heard from God. He asked me to, so you should probably ask him. I don't know. Not quite sure. Did you go to college? What's college? Did you go to school? 
Well, I am sure I had some training in my okay. younger. All right. Well, thank you. <coughs> anyway, about this journey that the Lord called you on. How did you break it to your wife? <laughs> she was she was pretty upset. You know how you know how hard it is to get up and leave your leave your home. You know, you fancy people have cars today. We had to walk. But not in the snow both ways. Okay. So would you say your wife took the news good? No. Kind of good? She got there. Did it require a step of faith on her behalf? Multiple. Multiple steps. Like I said, we didn't have cars. Good point. Which brings me to the last question that lots of people are wanting to know. Was there a sanitation crew to clean up after you guys and all your animals along this 550-mile trek? You know, there, there might have been, but probably not. I, I really wasn't paying attention to that stuff. I was just trying to figure out where to go. So this was really some messy, messy faith. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Abraham. Everyone, thank you, Abraham. I cannot even imagine. And after today, I would like you all to ponder that question. How would you share with your spouse, significant other, children, what it was like or what it would be like to be told, hey, we're going to leave everything behind and go. Now we get to hear from another friend. Please give a warm welcome to Tyler. I thought Abraham would have been taller. Anybody else? You know, we all get to imagine what they look like until we get to meet them in person someday. Okay. Okay. So I understand you have something you want to share with us today. Yes. Go for it. All Mic's right. all yours. All right, I'm going to hold the mic because it's really awkward not holding mics because I've been doing this all the time. Uh, so I want to share a story about when uh, when we when uh, Becky and I were pregnant with Abby. You've all seen Abby run around. She's always with kids and stuff, and she's bouncing everywhere. And, uh, you know, as you do when you find out you're pregnant, you go into the doctor, and you have to go through all the procedures and stuff. And Caleb, our, our son, was not even two years old yet, and we go into the doctor's office, and Becky goes back, and I'm hanging out with Caleb, and Becky goes out and gets the news that Abby is an impending miscarriage. Got two choices. Take a pill, flush her out now, or you can wait and let your body do it naturally. And Becky goes, I want to try everything I can to do this. And she told me as she walked out of that doctor's office and saw me and Caleb sitting there and looked into Caleb's little brown eyes, she heard God's audible voice in her head that just said, believe. And, I mean, obviously you all know the end of the story. You see Abby running around here. And... Uh, the story, the part I want to take on this is it wasn't just the fact that she believed and she went home and we went about life as normal. She believed and did everything that she was supposed to do in faith. She rested when she needed to rest. She did the, everything the doctor told her to do to make sure that she carried Abby to term. She was so stubborn about carrying Abby to term that she made sure she stayed until after midnight, after 36 weeks, to make sure she was full term on that. I'm not kidding. 1229 a.m., after 36 weeks, she let her finally come out because she wanted to make sure she went full term with that baby. And uh, just honestly, Becky's faith in knowing what she heard God say to her and to pursue that all the way through to give us a wonderful, beautiful little daughter that is the happiest, bounciest thing in the entire world is just fantastic. So that's all. Well, thank you, Tyler. Thank you for sharing. And this concludes today's CFPC news. We now turn it back over to the next program. Well, good morning, church.
Yeah, you know, I thought Abraham would be taller too, to be quite honest. I didn't know he wore Vans though. What a cool guy. <laughs> Not one gray hair. For 70 something plus, that's pretty good. Thanks, Ken. You're welcome. All right. I'm going to have some of this. Hmm. Messy faith. Part two. We are going to talk about Abraham, believe it or not. But first, let's check in. Tim's going to run around the microphone. I want to hear from you guys in just a few words. How have you reflected on faith this week? We can throw up the questions from last week. Ken, um, maybe what are some of the things you journal about, journaled about or even something that took place? Go ahead, share. Tony. I was going to bring a box of Band-Aids and pass them out. We could all stick Band-Aids on us today, and I forgot the Band-Aids. But... <laughs> um, it's, I don't think it's on that chart, but I went home and really pondered what it, just what gets me and gets me unsettled, and it's unanswered prayer. But is there really any such thing? Because I think God answers yes, no, or let's wait a while. Mm -hmm. And also, we have to remember when we get frustrated with those unanswered prayers, if they're involving other people, we don't have control over those other people. They have their own free will. So you just persevere, and I try and keep it in line with the Word of God and not let it unsettle me. <laughs> Doug, over here. Yeah, mine actually uh, was uh, question number two, practical ways that I can show compassion to people and myself when I'm uncomfortable, and uh, the, the first answer is listen. Uh, the second is agree to disagree. The third is refuse to argue. Hmm. That's good. Hmm. Nick? I had like a really, really close uh, driving incident yesterday, probably par partially to my foolishness, but it reminded me that God gives second chances. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, he does. Over and over. Tim. I really enjoyed and reflected on kind of the the deeper definition of faith, yeah. even bringing in, uh, what was her name? Marion something, Webster? M-Dub. M-Dub, yeah. <laughs> so that was really good. One more? Is this unsettling? I've got the gift of wiggles. Yeah, Bill. So I, God's been showing me to, to, to do more encouraging and more in uh, telling people what they are in my life when they're so just really uh, becoming more intimate and sharing things that are uncomfortable. And it's, it's comparable to compassion too. Yeah, huh? compassion. That's good, Bill. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing, those of you who shared. Is anybody thankful for air conditioning? I am right now. Like, Pardon? praise God. It's gross in here, isn't it? <laughs> it's getting better. Uh, great. Awesome. So, <clears throat> like uh, Pastor Tim said, last week we defined true faith. We talked about how faith in the Bible is always linked to what is sure, what is certain, what is true. We talked about how faith is not trying to convince yourself of something, but it's a choice. 
We talked about how blind faith is like slapping a Band-Aid on gaping wounds. Just have more faith. Pray more. You must not love Jesus enough. We talked about how that hurts people. Uh, it hurts ourselves, too, because we minimize real pain and real issues uh, that we need to process in a mature way and let Jesus heal. We talked about how messiness is the most important part of being authentically human. And I want to pick up right here. Because when we think of Abraham, right, we think, wow, the father of the nations, the example of biblical faith. We think of how the New Testament uses him as an example over and over. We think of God's covenant. But when I think of Abraham, I look back at his story, I see something just a little different. I see those things, yes. But I'll tell you what I see. But remember last week, I asked you what unsettles you. What makes you squirm? What makes you just a little uncomfortable? And we said all these things here. We've got uh, politics and expectations and crocs. For this right here, this is, I just love Lisa because she's so unsettled by me writing left-handed on this thing. Uh, anger, when you just can't, stubbornness, manipulation, disrespect. We've got a bunch of these things here. Um, and we talked about how we slap these faith concepts on these things to hide from them or overlook them instead of taking an honest look at them with Jesus. But you know, when you, one of these things that no one else said, and you know, I think it was Janine that said the simplicity of Jesus. She got close. But has that, did, nobody really said God or God's love. When I look back at Abraham's story, I see a messy, authentic human who believed God to be certain and true and was unsettled by it. So let's take a second. To be unsettled by God, what the heck does that mean? That, like, it doesn't make sense at first. It seems kind of backwards, right? Because, like, well, God's our great healer. He's our comforter. He's our strength and our rock and our cornerstone. And he is our peace and our joy and our steadiness. And yes, Yes, he is. He certainly is. But in his perfection and in our imperfection, in order for us to truly rely on him, something inside of us needs to be unsettled. Being unsettled is not bad. We think it's bad because we associate it with uncomfortable things, things we don't like, hard stuff. But God still moves in unsettledness, doesn't he? So we're going to dive into that. We're going to look at the Bible. We're going to go to Genesis 12. We're going to start in verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Abram and Abraham are the same people. God changes his name later, so don't get confused. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham departed as the Lord instructed. So we're going to stop here and look at this. God tells Abraham to leave everything behind. He's going to make him into a great nation. God tells them to leave behind the very components you need to build a nation, land and people. More than that, Abraham was from like a big city. Like this place is peak civilization, the commercial hub of the country, center of politics, the home to the temple of the Babylonian moon god whose name ironically is Sin. And Abraham's told to leave it all behind. His lifestyle, his comfort, his security, his connections, his support net his inheritance, his settledness. And God uproots Abraham from his life. And Abraham goes. And he says, okay, God. So pick back up in verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed 
and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran, which is really near that big city. Uh, he took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot and all of his wealth, his livestock, all the people he had taken into his household and headed for the land of Canaan. And when they arrived at Canaan, Abraham, or Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem and there he set up camp beside the Oak of Mora. At that time, the area was inhabited by Canaanites. But then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. So Abraham built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. After that, Abram traveled south and set up camp in the hill country with Bethel to the west and I, A, A, I, yep, to the east. There he built another altar, dedicated it to the Lord and worshiped the Lord. And then Abraham continued traveling south by stages toward the Negev. Okay. So old man Abraham is uprooted from his life, packs everything up, all the people in his house, goes to Canaan, the place that God leads him to. He gets there, and in his mind, he's probably thinking, you know, looking for a nice little plot of land, start a nation. But God says, uh, yeah, this place is already inhabited. But I'm going to give this to your descendants. Not even you. I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to your descendants. I can imagine what's going through Abraham's mind at this point. Like, God's leading me to this place, and we're going to make a great nation. And here's this land already has people in it. And what, God, where am I supposed to, what? So eventually he sets up camp, and God says, this is land I'm going to give to your descendants, not you. You're not going to see it in your lifetime. But those after you will dwell here. And so how does Abraham respond? He worships. He builds an altar to God that marks where he communed with God and he worshiped him. Okay, Abraham is off to a good start. That's hard stuff. He believed and obeyed God despite his age, despite those around him, despite the looks of the situation. Good job, Abraham. But let me ask you this. Have you ever said yes to God about something and you obey and then it gets hard? <laughs> I'll take your chuckles as a yes. Or maybe something bad happens or you're struggling more than usual. Yeah, okay. So Abraham says yes to God. Moves to a brand new place, attempts to settle there because God promised that the land would be for his descendants. But then something bad happens. Verse 10, at that time, a severe famine struck in the land of Canaan, forcing Abraham to go down to Egypt where he lived as a foreigner. And now watch this. Watch what Abraham does. As he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abraham looks at his wife. He says, hey, babe, you real catch. When the Egyptians see you, they're going to be like, whoa, his wife, a real snack. Let's kill him so we can have her. So please tell them you're my sister. Then they'll spare my life and treat me well because of their interest in you. Abraham. Why would Abraham lie now all of a sudden? I mean, yeah, technically, he's, he, she's his half-sister, and that's a whole other thing. It's probably not for kids, but... Like, yeah, technically it was a truth, but there's deceit involved, right? So it's a lie. Like, let's not make it complicated. If you're trying to deceive somebody, it's a lie. But what was the purpose of that, Abraham? Doesn't, doesn't he know that God made a covenant with him? Like, this is, like, not just a promise. It's a covenant. Like, does he know how big of a deal that is? Here's what I think. Abraham probably saw himself as a dead man and decided to concoct a plan to not be killed. Plus, how can God make a nation out of a dead man? Abraham was experiencing fear. And out of that fear, he planned and he thought and he moved. Abraham's faith shifted. Instead of God's promises being certain and true to him, death became more certain and true to him. And as a result, Abraham acted in fear. He came up with a getaway plan, an escape 
Now, escapes are always, always founded on a lie, and the lie is something like, I can handle this without God. My way of coping, my natural way of handling hard situations, my default response has always worked, so why wouldn't it now? But these are the lies that inspire us to compromise and rationalize away God's truth. This is a sneaky thing fear does to us, isn't it? Fear manipulates us. And fear wants us to think that God is farther than he actually is. Fear wants us to think that we're isolated. And fear wants us to feel a false urgency to take things into our own hands sooner rather than later. What a jerk. What is fear? Let's talk about that for a moment. Yes. <laughs> fear is the emotion we feel when we sense danger or uh, in our own perception, someone or something that matters to us is being threatened. This danger may be real, it may be physical, it may be abstract, it may be imagined. Fear looks like anything from you know, anxiety that in induces stress to downright terror and paralysis but fear tells us that something we care about is at risk and it moves us to protect the thing that we care about and we intuitively try to do this by means of running, retreating, or escaping. Now there can be a healthy fear. A healthy fear keeps us out of danger and can become a path to wisdom. A healthy fear leads us to awe of God and this awe of God, this recognition that God is so much bigger so much more that his love is so encompassing and it's so unsettling and all of it this awe is just so frightfully overwhelming in a good way but then there's unhealthy fear it's the fear that deeply deeply dreads the fear that manipulates us and tells us lies you know if i was going to try and get into abraham's mind like i could understand his fear his life was at risk and if his life was at risk, God's promise could potentially be at risk. But there's another sneaky part of this unhealthy fear. It isolates you. And it makes you think that you're on your own. And it disregards God and it disregards others. And this is dangerous. Fear's number one tactic is to get you to forget the basics. What are the basics? basics. What are the basics? What are the things that fear is trying to get you to forget? God is good. That's a good basic. He's in charge. He's always with us. Trust his word. We are loved. Yes. Basics. Protection. I don't know where that came from, but yes. Carolyn. Yes. He's a provider. I heard another one. Almighty. Father, these are good basics. These are good basics. And, and, you know, while we might remember them, we forget them. And we forget the implications of them and what they mean and the power that comes with them, right? Fear, its number one tactic is to get you to forget those things because if fear can rattle you enough that your own logic and reality and your basics are out of the picture, you're in trouble. When anxiety is so high and the red lights are flashing and the sirens are blaring in your heart and your mind, this urgency floods your being and all you want is for everything to stop, right? But you can't remember who you are, whose you are, and what power comes with that. And that is when you run back to taking matters into your own hands. That's when you go to your quick fix, your box of band-aids. That's when you start saying, nope, and avoiding all the issues relying on your own silly survival techniques. And in those moments, you're not concerned with anyone else either. Abraham responded out of this fear and ironically jeopardizes the very thing he may have been seeking to protect. So we're going to keep reading. Verse 14. Sure enough, when Abram arrived in Egypt, everyone noticed Sarai's beauty when the palace officials saw her, they sang her praises to Pharaoh, their king. 
Sarai was taken into his palace. Then Pharaoh gave Abram many gifts because, because of her. Sheep, goats, cattle, male, female donkeys, male, female servants, and camels. The Lord sent terrible plagues upon Pharaoh and his household because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh summoned Abram and accused him sharply. What have you done to me? He demanded, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say, oh, she's my sister and allow me to take her as my wife? Now here's your wife. Take her and get out of here. And Pharaoh ordered some of his men to escort them, and he sent Abram out of the country along with his wife and all his possessions. Abram was so concerned for his life, he gave his wife to Pharaoh. And so here's Sarah getting the crummy end of the deal, and here's Abraham rolling in the benefits, except he seems to have forgotten one tiny little just important part that he is kind of jeopardizing God's promise but that didn't really stand, did it? God sent plagues and all these things to help continue to keep his side of the covenant. But now Abraham's issues have multiplied, right? Because of his deceit in the first place, in the midst of a famine, they've been kicked out of the place that has food. And what's worse, I don't know that Abraham really learned a lesson here. Because he does the same exact thing in another place that they enter in chapter 20. And this has implications. It seems that if, if Abraham didn't already have a problem, he was developing a pattern of lying in response to his own fear, and it was affecting everyone around him. His wife, the people he was lying to, the rest of his household. This also has some Serious implications spiritually. So, what do we do with this? Is Abraham a good example of faith or not? What can we learn from Abraham? Well, first I'm going to argue that Abraham's an excellent example of faith. Why? Because he believed God and obeyed him. And just because it was messy doesn't mean that Abraham didn't have faith. It meant that God had room to grow his faith. Here's the thing. God knew Abraham. He knew before he chose him. He knew before he made the covenant. He knew where his faith was. He knew how it needed to grow. He knew his family and his background. God knew. And here is what I wonder. Do you think God ever uses hard things to reveal to us who we truly are? Like, I'm not saying God sent the famine, but if the famine's going to happen anyways, God's not going to waste a moment of it to show Abraham where he falls short and why he needs to rely on God. It's, it's in our shortcomings, right? It's in our mistakes that we learn to rely more on God. It's in the mistakes that we make over and over and over again that we begin to experience the steadfastness of the Lord and his love for us and his deep commitment to us on brand new levels. It's in those moments of the anger and the frustration and the disgust that you might have with yourself sometimes about your inability to change bad habits or addictions or coping mechanisms or thought processes, all that stuff. Those moments when you just want to scream at God, ask him, ask him why it even is that he loves you in the first place, because all you see is a great big mess. Or maybe that's just me. I mean, maybe that's just my process and y'all are fine. But it's in those moments, too, of hopelessness when we're asking Jesus, Jesus why he's even still there when we have even abandoned ourselves. Jesus, why? why? Not everybody has experienced this, and that's okay. But for those of you who identify, you understand how unsettling God's love can be when we think so low of ourselves and demand that we don't deserve it. And we don't. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve the perfect love, but he gives it to us anyways. And he doesn't hold back. And, and these are the moments I have personally gotten to know the Lord better. He is sweet and he is steady when I am not. <laughs> Nothing about Abraham was perfect. Nothing about Abraham was good enough. Abraham in his response to God, chose faith 
and continually chose faith over and over and over, even after his mistakes. God did not give up on Abraham, but you know what? Abraham did not give up on God. God created a trust with Abraham, and Abraham learned to trust God. And it was messy. God didn't punish him. There were some consequences to help him hopefully learn from his mistakes, but God ends up blessing Abraham. He knew that Abraham was learning and growing and doing something that no one else had done before. In the same way, our faith doesn't have to be complete and it doesn't have to be perfect. God doesn't waste our mistakes. He uses them to show us who we truly are, what our weaknesses are, where we need to rely on him more. And he works on transforming us. He builds trust with us and he reveals himself to us. And there are times when God's love is unsettling to us because like in Abraham's life, it shakes up everything we know. It shakes up the kingdoms that we've built inside ourselves that uproots us from the way that we've been living and brings us into a new place, a new reality. One that deeply involves God and is messy. And it's okay. Do you want to know why it's okay to be messy? You want to know why it was okay for Abraham to be messy? You want to know how it is that we get unsettled by this love that we don't deserve? Or why it's, it's, that sentence doesn't even make sense. Who wrote this? <laughs> when we're done with ourselves and all of our stupid mistakes, why is it okay? Why does God stay closer to us than we can even imagine? Because he loves us. Because he's a God of grace. He has grace for the mistakes. He's got grace for the learning process. And in every area that you feel shame, he's drowning you with grace. And that can be seriously unsettling also. Um, hey, Naomi and Debbie, wherever you guys are at, can you guys come up? And then prayer teams, will you get ready? Here's some questions for this week. Go ahead and journal them. If uh, you missed last week's questions, or if you don't have a bulletin, we've got uh, those inserts on the back uh, baptism box over there by the journals. Feel free to tape them in your journal or take them home with you or whatever you want to do. Number one, what part of you needs to be unsettled by God's love? Number two, what are the lies that inspire you to make compromises? Don't worry, this isn't a pass or fail test. You're not getting graded. Number three, what has God revealed to you about yourself recently? And I've got a bonus question for you that I uh, didn't get to put up on there. In what area do you need to accept God's grace? Where are you being too hard on yourself? If, uh, if you had some immediate answers pop into your head to any of these, uh, and, and you want to process them or get prayer over them or something, we're going to have prayer teams up here. Come get prayer. There's no shame in coming and getting prayer. We are here for it. We're here for all of it, and we want to love you well on your journey of answering hard questions, your journey of doing hard things with Jesus, your journey of not covering these things with Band-Aids. Debbie and Naomi are going to play a little, little something-something, and uh, go ahead and sing along and get some prayer. I'll come up here and dismiss in a few minutes. The greatness of mercy.
waiting for prayer, please continue waiting. It's worth it, I promise. Um, but other than that, you're dismissed. Don't forget your kids. Don't forget to journal this week. Stuff like that. But we love you guys, and we'll see you next week. Pastor Ray, preaching for Father's Day. It rhymes, so it's true. All right, we love you guys. Please get prayer if you need it. And don't forget your kids.